Welcome to lecture 21 of Biology 115 entitled Macroevolution. As we continue our discussion on evolution, and we started with by looking at the ideas of Darwinian evolution, and then we moved forward with microevolution in our previous lecture, we're going to broaden our horizons, broaden the scope of what we're looking at, and we'll do this by first starting with an introduction flowchart to macroevolution. So let's do an introduction first. So in this introduction flowchart, we're going to bring up some old concepts and just look at how they relate to the new concept that we're studying. Specifically, in this introduction, we'll first remember what microevolution was all about. So let's write down microevolution just so that we don't forget. And this is going to be a point of comparison. Microevolution can be defined as the following microevolution uh, results in changes over time. And that's the idea of evolution, right? Changes over time. But specifically, these changes have to be uh, significant. And their significancy is directly related to the fact that these changes are happening in what we called allele frequency, AF, allele frequency within a population. So we had a lot of things that devoted to the changes in allele frequency. Remember Hardy-Weinberg, things of that nature. Those are devoted to looking at changes in allele frequency. Once we have those changes and they're at the population level, not at the individual, we have what we call microevolution. Then what is macroevolution? So let's do macroevolution, a uh, simple definition right next to it. So macroevolution, micro means small and macro means big. So if we think of macroevolution, we're going to define it um, a little bit more broadly in the sense that macroevolution can be defined as a broad pattern. And the idea of it being a pattern is important, as we'll see later. It's a broad pattern of evolution, so I'll just write broad pattern of evo, that actually occurs, and this is going to be a bit difficult to understand at first, but bear with me. It's called above the species, SPP stands for species level. So let's repeat that one more time. Macroevolution is a broad pattern of evolution that occurs above the species level. I want you to underline above the species level. This is something that we're going to be tackling as we move forward. Just keep this in the back of your head for right now. What I really want to dissect further is the idea of a species. For many lectures now, we've been saying the word species and we haven't really given it a definite you know, idea of what it really is. So what we can define as a species is all relative to who we're looking at and what concept we're thinking of. The idea of a species in Darwinian evolution may differ a bit from the idea of a species in macroevolution. These are distinctions that we're going to touch upon. We'll start this idea of looking at this word, species, by defining it incredibly broadly, just so that we have a point of comparison, just like we did with uh, the idea of macro versus microevolution. So a species can be defined as simply a kind of organism. This is something that you've understood for a very long time, ever since you've been learning about science, it seems. It's just a kind of organism. But again, this is a very vague, vague way of thinking of a, spe a species. There, are, there, has to, there has to be some sort of stipulation, some sort of rule as to the, what defines a species and what does not define a species. Some sort of categories have to be fulfilled for us to really define a species and thus for us, because once we've defined a species, we can then apply macroevolution at the species or above the species level. So this idea of species um, can be really tied into um, a big, big topic of today. I can think I would say that the subtopic, the subtitle of this entire uh, lecture on macroevolution could be the following. It could simply be speciation. We're going to be looking at a lot of this. But specifically, let's understand what speciation is all about. This is the process of creating a species. This is a macro evolution, big time evolution. Nothing we, in our previous evolutionary concept, we looked at just the changes in allele frequencies that's within a population, thus within a species. We're going to go above that now. We're going to look at how species themselves evolve into this respective species that we see all around us. Speciation can be broadly defined as the following. Speciation is a process, so it's the process, and we're going to say the process by which one species, okay, by which one species, and when you're saying one species, you just write SP instead of S double P. So the process by which one species, okay, it's actually going to be splitting. This is called the divergence, splits into 
um, now two or more species. So now since we have two, we're going to say two or more, and now we can actually say S double P. That's the idea of the double P versus the single P. So whenever you see that differentiation, just be uh, understand that it's because you're referring to one. If you see one letter P and two or more, you will see two letter P's. So let's repeat that one more time. The process by which one species splits into two or more species. This is a working definition because this working definition is going to lead to something we've already covered, but it's important to emphasize. The tremendous, absolutely mind-boggling, to me at least, the tremendous diversity of life that we see. It is absolutely crazy to see the amount of diversity all around us. Crazy enough that we've already established this number, but it's worth reiterating. We have 1.8 million species that have been identified, right? That sounds like a lot. That sounds like a lot, and it is a lot. But what's even more crazy to me is that 10 to 100 million species have yet to be identified. These are the, um, the uh, species that we think exist in total on this very beautiful planet Earth that we have. So, how does this relate back to macroevolution? Well, this relates back to macroevolution because remember what evolution is. Evolution is modification with descent. We're going to be looking at that, uh, or descent with modification, excuse me. This evolution, descent with modification, can be looked at in the speciation world because when we say that a new species evolves, that new species oftentimes always shares, um, new species uh, tend to share many characteristics, okay? This is the idea of um, descent with modification, okay? They're sharing those characteristics. The descent is shared. New species share many characteristics because they're descended from a common ancestor, because they're, they are descended, and there's that descent, um, from common ancestor. So remember how we said the process by which one species splits into two or more species? When we have this speciation event, we're having a branching off from a common ancestor. And we're going to be seeing that more so when you look at phylogenetics um, in a later lecture. But for right now, let's keep this idea of speciation in our heads, and we're going to relate it back to macroevolution soon enough. Now, the last thing we want to cover in this introduction is a powerful, powerful way to understand a species a little bit better than just saying that it's a kind of organism. And we're going to look at something called the biological species concept. This is a very good way to look at a species. And this uh, idea was developed by a man by the name of Ernst Mayer, so we're going to give credit where credit is due, of course. And Ernst Mayer came up with what we call the biological species concept. He's, of course, a biologist, and he looked at species in the realm of biology. And he defined a species with the following. So we're going to define a species underneath the biological species concept. So be aware that this is a species, SPP, is going to be defined right now under this realm that Ernst Mayer developed. He developed the stipulation, the rules for a species. And he said the rule was the following. A species can be defined under this concept as a group of populations... Okay, as a group of populations, meaning that many different uh, populations of the same species, okay, that can, that can, and this is critical here, that can interbreed. This is a key thing for his biological species concept. Group of populations that can interbreed in nature, so this is not artificial, this is a natural interbreeding event, that means that they can mate with each other, they are compatible with each other, but this mating, this compatibility directly has to, has to, has to lead to the following. Group of populations that can interbreed in nature to produce and this is critical in his concept, um, the fact that there's interbreeding, but then the production of that interbreeding is not just any old offspring, but two key words you have to know, viable plus fertile offspring, okay? Viable, underline that, and underline fertile offspring. Those two things are very simple ideas. Viable just means living, healthy, and fertile means the ability to pass on its genes. It can later go and uh, do this interbreeding event just like its parents did. That's the importance of viability and fertility in the offspring. If you do not have a viable offspring, you do not have a species. If you do not have a fertile offspring, you do not have a species. Notice how this is an and. This is not an either or situation. We're going to be um, looking at this in much greater detail when we go over speciation uh, in the later flowcharts. Now, in addition to this idea on, of the biological species concept and this definition, we can also state, and Ernst Mayer stated, that species share a common gene pool. This seems um, pretty obvious, and it is. Species share 
common gene pool. And that is simply because of what? What is the rule here? The rule is that a group of populations that can interbreed. If these group of populations, this, this species, it's interbreeding, they are, of course, sharing a common gene pool. All of the genes, all of the alleles within this species are shared within a common gene pool because of the potential to interbreed. All of the gametes and all of the alleles that those gametes possess are shared within what we call a common gene pool within the biological species concept. Now, in addition, we have to understand that gene flow, okay, gene flow. Remember what we said what gene flow was in microevolution, the passing on of genes? Gene flow happens, but gene flow happens in one specific way. It has to be between, gene flow between members of the species. So this is critical here, members of SPP. So this is okay. We do have gene flow between members of species. That's why we get a common gene pool. But we do not want uh, um, this idea of gene flow happening uh, within, let's say, an exchanging of gene pools. What I mean by this is that, and we're going to extend our knowledge over here, we have to sort of put a caveat here. We have to put sort of a rule. But, you know, there is gene flow between members of the species, but the species... Do not, do not, absolutely do not, underline, do not exchange genes with other species, okay? Exchange genes with other species. Now, why don't they do that? Because they cannot interbreed. Remember the rule. The rule of the biological species concept is that the group of populations that can interbreed. Of course, if they can't interbreed, they cannot exchange genes with other species because they are incompatible. Their breeding, their mating process is incompatible. And we have a nice technical term for this, and we're going to learn all about it in our next flowchart called reproductive isolation. Reproductive isolation mechanisms really are going to govern speciation. We're going to get to that as we move forward, but just have an idea of this for right now. When the exchanging of genes between other species does not happen, that's because of reproductive isolation. Makes a lot of sense. Very easy term to remember, and we're going to look at it in much greater detail as we move forward. And final thing about the biological species concept, it is as great as it is, a bit limited in its knowledge in the sense that this biological species concept only works for living organisms. Thus, it is actually not useful for a fossil species that we discover, for fossil, let's say, species. If we discover a fossil species, we cannot consider it a species at all because of the rule right here, that the, it has to be a group of populations that can interbreed. And this is not going to happen if you have a fossil. Fossils are dead. These, these animals are no longer living. There's no potential for interbreeding. There's no potential for viable or fertile offspring. So that's a limitation. So we might have to broaden our horizons as to this, the species concept that we use when we discover fossils fossils, let's say. When somebody discovers a fossil, how will they be able to tell what type of species it is? They obviously cannot use the biological species concept because the fossil is, of course, dead. And lastly, um, another a big limitation of Ernst Mayer's biological species concept and final thing is that it doesn't apply to asexual organisms. It does not apply to asexual organisms, um, uh, for example, like prokaryotes. All prokaryotes do not uh, uh, so many prokaryotes actually do not have this interbreeding potential because they are asexually reproducing. So how do we classify a prokaryotic species? We, of course, cannot use the biological species concept. So just understand the limitations, understand the power of this species concept that Mr. Mayer uh, developed, and understand the idea of speciation itself. We're going to be expanding on all of this knowledge as we move forward through this lecture.